Welcome back to Mages and Murder Dads. This is episode 73. It's our final episode of content. We're going to have one more reflection episode, but uh, final. And we're going to get to we're, it. We're going to do it. Uh, we're going to absolutely just charge in nose first. If you want to recap, listen to the other Listen episodes. to the other episodes, but uh, I'm Cameron. <laughs> I'm Danny. Listen to the other episodes. That's our new catchphrase. Yeah. We're going to start mm-hmm. saying that all the time. Listen to the other episodes. Listen to the other 72. To, you, will, you will never understand episode 9 of Disco Elysium if you don't understand episode 4 of Baldur's Gate. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's actually, that might be like Danny's big problem. That's a key episode. <laughs> that might be true. That might actually explain more than you think. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, we just confronted Ruby. And uh, that ended poorly for both of us. She is dead. Both yeah, of us. She is dead. Mm-hmm. And uh, tell me, tell me, we, um, Kim says, we got to go back to the Worley and Rags. Like, which means I go immediately to the church and I try to dance. And Kim says, you can't dance. We have to go to the Worley we're busy. and Rags. <laughs> yeah. All of your side quests are, you're now locked gotcha. out. You're yeah. done. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so basically, because we don't have a suspect anymore, or, or because we pursued the wrong thing, we gotta go tell Titus, and we gotta like figure out what the hell is going on. And yeah. Also, I think we just gotta like gotta call it in too. I think that's a big part of going back to the Warling and Rags is like figuring out what the next step is. Yeah, and we've got to call the precinct to tell them there's a corpse here that needs to be <laughs> sent to the morgue. Like, there's a bunch of reasons why we gotta exactly. Go back. And so I get a warning. Once I'm going past the, um, uh, gosh, the, the kind of street trader guy whose name I remembered earlier and now I forgot. Mm-hmm. Uh, the pawn shop. Uh, yeah, the pawn shop. And it's a um, uh, Inland Empire thing. And it was like, hey, there's danger up ahead. Again, kind of like before. And I was able to be like, hey, Kim, there's danger up ahead. And he's like, yeah, I can hear a commotion. Let's see what's going on. And so. Do you shift around your inventory after you get that warning? Oh, Here's a little bit of info. That's a great question. Mm-hmm. She had a gun. Oh, yeah. And that's now right. I've got a gun, buddy. Oh, you didn't even find I, your gun. And I'm yet, not, you're armed. And, uh, I am armed. So I've been, I immediately put that in my right hand and I've been running around with a gun in my hand since that happened. So I, I didn't shift around my inventory as far as clothing is concerned, but I do have my gun. Okay, I've got my full tracksuit. I've got my service weapon in my right hand and her weapon in my left hand. Okay, all right. Dual Dual wielding. wielding. I didn't even think about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, all right, well, uh, how'd this go? What happened? So basically, you you get closer to your car and the Aranyi's Merc, uh, who was kind of basically the head of the scabs, up at the gate, um, the right to work guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's in his full ceramic armor, as is uh, two other people. And my first thought was, "Oh my god, there are two. There are three of them total. We totally missed that." I knew that, like from previously talking to uh, Joyce, we thought there were only three total. With uh, the death of the hanged man, we thought, "Oh, there are two remaining." So we miscounted. I think that there is a way. If you investigate differently, you can find out that there is a third. So there are three characters. Uh, Do you have the names on you? I I don't. One Mm -hmm. one is is... Courtenair is him. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know her name and I also never found her. And then the other guy has like uh, like a Dutch name. Yeah, and he is in a full getup, including like almost a plague mask. Yeah, he's... That is ceramic well, it, armor. It's, it's uh, kind of half plague mask and then half um, like uh, Don Quixote helmet, like a knight's mm-hmm. helmet almost, like a, that I associate with like Spanish knight dumb. That's the only place I've ever seen a helmet like that is like in Don Quixote, uh, you know, um, renditions. Anyway, mm-hmm. but yeah, mm-hmm. but he's got that and he has like a gun. Like they all like a giant sniper yeah, rifle. Yeah, he has a, a straight up rifle and every, and Courtenaire has like a pistol and I I don't know what the uh, the woman. I wasn't quite sure what she had. Yeah, she, it, it, she's the, her back's kind of to the camera in the isometric but perspective, we, so you don't get a very good look. But we've encountered him before. He's the right to work guy, but I did not encounter mm-hmm. either of these other two, did you? 
I don't okay. think so, no. I, I think that she might have been in the crowd, but I never spoke to her before. Um, but it seemed like the game, I was aware of at least one of them in the game's fiction, yeah. but I as a player was not aware of, I was only aware of the main yeah, fellow. Um, so I walk up there, there's immediately like words being exchanged between Titus, between Titus's, you know, Evart's lawyer and the mercenaries. Mm -hmm. And the mercenaries are really angry and they're basically confronting the Hardy Boys, Titus and the lawyer are saying, hey, you're drunk, you need to calm down. But they're here to get revenge for their fallen uh, comrade, basically. This is this is the situation. Yeah, any talk about tribunal, you know, even though that might be what this is, is like implicitly a military tribunal, it's clearly not. There's no, like, justice being done here, and there's not even an illusion of that, right? Like, these no. people are drunk, and they are ready to, to kill people to do a revenge killing like that like mm -hmm. there is no even artifice at this point that it's anything other than that yeah which i mean you do have to remember uh the hardy boys took pains to stage the hanged man's corpse in a way that it was pretty like on on its surface it would appear that they were responsible and they kind of like bragged about it. They, they, they were the ones posing as if that was what occurred. Yeah. Because their problem was not the mercenaries as far as they knew. Right. Their problem wasn't mm -hmm. the mercenaries. Their problem was the RCM. They prepped their strategy mm -hmm. to deal with you because you could not arrest all of them. They didn't yeah. prep their strategy for an extrajudicial murder gang. Um, extrajudicial mur murder gang in what amounts to adamantium armor <laughs> yes. and fully automatic weapons that are that are incredibly rare and years of uh, of like uh, of warfare training abroad where they were able to like commit war crimes with impunity yeah, and like just the, the absolute most horrific thing you could imagine. Yeah, Courtenay, the leader, or I guess the leader now. Keeps calling mm -hmm. them, you know, quote unquote, loincloths, which is what these mercenaries keep calling uh, basically anyone who isn't them. Um, you yeah. Know, and, and to him, there is no his power relationship to the locals anywhere is exactly the same. Right. Like mm -hmm. everyone is subhuman compared to him. Period. You know, the, the Imperial yeah. Corps is the same as the, uh, you know, the periphery here. He is the colonial mind, mind space, uh, in a like focused, like like a magnifying glass in the sun onto into one individual yep. and one mentality. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have some options. You can basically like turn to Kim and say a couple of things, but I didn't even say anything to Kim. I immediately ran in between the two and said, hey, the police are here. You'll need to calm down. I, how, how do you I react? said a couple things to Kim, just kind of clarifying what was up, but is that you end up in that same spot. Mm-hmm. Okay. And once you're in there, this goes real fast for me. I don't know how this works for you, but my hand-eye coordination and I think my fight-or-flight response, which I believe is half-life, uh, basically tells mm -hmm. me you need to act fast. Mm. Hmm. And I comply. What do you do? I I was able to say a little bit of information. I was able to say um, Ruby didn't. I, I think I'm pretty sure I asserted that, that Ruby didn't kill anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and that we still don't know who did. But it mm -hmm. wasn't the Hardy Boys' fault, basically, is the the way I got there. This is the place, I'm pretty sure, where I was able to assert that Ruby was afraid of... She thought I was a mesk, um, uh, like, uh, God, drug cartel. She th mm, a, a representative oh, yes. of the, of the car cartel, which I think does have, like, a name... It's it's like a, I forget what the official yeah. term for the cartel is. Uh, I think this is where I was able to say that, and I I never learned that. It's interesting. I did learn that in a conversation with the racist lorry driver. Um, 
after I looked through Ruby's Lori because I was able, like, basically, I think the the drug cartels are associated with this particular mess cartel. Mm -hmm. Like, any drug running is immediately, like, it's assumed. And I was able to, like, attempt to represent myself as an agent Mm. of that cartel. That is that it, it wormed its way into the RCM uh, in an attempt to intimidate the the lorry gotcha. driver. So, but then again, the connection. I think that there is a stronger way to make that connection. But yeah, it never was explicit for me. Well, either. it just never came up, as far as I know, in the game for me at all. Mm. And so it was really weird. Mm. But and I think I, this is where I did that. But I might be wrong. I might I, that this that might have happened in another conversation somewhere else. That's all to say. Mm-hmm. The game also tells me, hey, shit's about to go down. Um, and I was able to talk to Courtenaire, the guy, and I know Lely's real name, which is also Courtenaire. Oh, yeah. okay. And so I immediately, like, I can put it all together, right? It's all like, you know, matrixing in my brain. He also has blue eyes, right? Same. This mm-hmm. guy is Lely's brother. His real oh, brother. Oh, God. And so I have... And you showed him the corpse. Oh yeah. Oh yes. The picture yes, earlier. Yes, and so I I um am able to assert this and I have got I think an eighty something percent chance to like make this check and I just beefed it. Oh, and no. a, a part of me so deeply just wanted to reload my game because I was very curious about like what does it look like to actually make this work? And then I thought, no, I, I really don't want to do that. I don't want to like optimally work, walk through this. And so, he, so I tried to do that. And then he tells the killer, the guy who's in the full body armor, to shoot. Yes. That guy shoots at me. And then I dodge out of the way. And you I succeed. succeed on that dodge, which I have like a 17% chance on, very low. Wow. I, I get that dodge. And then um, Kim shoots that guy in the eyeball at the exact same moment. That I dodge. So, so like, we one, two shot mm-hmm. that. Then, um, Courtenay pulls his pistol on me. He fires and hits someone, one of the Hardy boys, and then trains it on me. And then I say, look, you know, I'm the person trying to get justice for your brother. And then he just shoots me. And I have the option there to try to dodge it. And that dodge chance is even lower or to just take it. And I just, I just Whoa. took it. I just said I'll I'll just get shot. And I got mm-hmm. shot. Did you die? Well, what happened for you here? Did you get shot at any time? So I don't talk when my hand eye coordination says this is gonna get worse if you don't talk. If you don't act fast, and I trusted it. So I just shot Courtenaire immediately. Just like right after I got in between them and like some words were exchanged, I just raised my pistol and mm-hmm. shot him and he fell mm-hmm. down. I hit him like in the in the jaw, like it was in and out of his cheek. Oh, yeah, because he's not wearing a helmet. He's not wearing a helmet. The killer trains a rifle on me. I dodge the same as with you. Kim shoots him. The woman shoots a hardy boy. Courtenaire raises his pistol as he's prone on the ground. He recovers and he shoots at me. And kind of in the fiction of the game, it's like because I was already kind of like, uh, you know, I didn't have my feet under me because I had just dodged before. I I have a very low percentage chance to dodge this one. And I try to dodge it, but I oh, fail. Bummer. And, I, and I get shot. So we're both in the same... I think now we're both, we've caught up with each other and we're in the same circumstances where we've just been shot. The difference is, uh, for me, Courtenay has been shot as well and he's prone. Mm. But otherwise, it seems like a very similar situation. One Hardy Boy has been shot for each Yes, yeah, so I'm like completely beefed mm-hmm. up and I can hear all the, the Hardy Boys being murdered. Like oh, they're no. all being shot. Like I can, I, I get something like a little bit. Of, the screen is black, but I'm getting some descriptive dialogue. That's like you hear Titus being filled full of bullets, which is like a huge bummer. I like kind Whoa. of come to and um, uh, Kim is like trying to to keep me from bleeding out, and I'm saying like, "Am I dying?" And he's like, "Yes, but but I'm trying to help you out here." Um, Courtenay walks up behind him and is about to like execute him. 
and I have the option to like yell and, and tell Kim to move or just don't say anything. And this is like kind of a big, kind of a big choice for me. Whoa. Because I could be, I could just let Kim die. And I really thought about it. I actually Dang. really thought about it. I was like, well, like what, what does this look like for my character? Right. Mm-hmm. What's interesting is that I have bonuses to, this is a check. Uh, I don't remember what the check is, but it's a check. It's a spree to core. Yeah, I think. Maybe, yeah, maybe so. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I get bonuses to it because Kim trusts me and Kim likes me. And I don't know why <laughs> for either. It's things. because it's because you're uh, you're such a cop. I think Kim really respects like people that uh, the, the one time like when I was wearing a police officer's uniform or like a couple of pieces. He's like, hey, I really appreciate that you're you're in uniform. Yeah, today. maybe so. But I, I mean, it's a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's a, a certainly a dispiriting message that I can personally insult this man every single moment of his life. He's a moralist. It's it's not about the personal. It's about the uh, it's about your role in the organization. Yeah, I guess I you know I I think I think Kim Kitsuragi might have been the tickle var the whole time. Yeah. But, <laughs> oh but yeah. yeah. So in a, so there's a little bit of a disjuncture I, there for me, you know, in the sense of I just don't know. I feel like the sheer amount of racist things I have said and allowed to be said to Kim should maybe have some sort of impact on how much he trusts me as a human being. Yeah. But that's not the case. Okay. What do you do? So I said, Kim, get out of the way. <laughs> like, I just didn't, you know, I, I feel like, uh, you know, Harry, this Harry Dubois that I'm playing is like structurally a big racist. But I don't think he personally has anything against Kim Kitsuragi as a dude. And, yeah. I, you know, may, this is a little bit of, like, external, you know, it's hard to roleplay this. I don't hate Kim Kitsuragi. I think he's cool. I think Kim Kitsuragi is one of the best NPCs to ever be put in a video game ever. And it's really yeah. difficult to be like, nah, fuck it. <laughs> Let him get killed. And so I didn't. I was like, Kim, you gotta get out of the way. And he dodge rolls immediately and then shoots Courtney in the head. Whoa. Yeah, he, like, you know, uh, buddy cops his way right through it. And then I pass out. And that's all I got. In mine, I try to open my eyes and I get a hazy like image and it's the same thing. Kim's there and I say, oh, I think I'm dying. It's it's time, mm-hmm. you know, live, live fast, die old, I say. <laughs> and Kim's like, OK, keep talking. You need to get a stay, have you stay conscious. And the woman I can see like is walking up behind Kim with her gun drawn and I have an esprit de corps check two, but my psyche is one. <laughs> and even though I have several pluses, I have a 30% chance and I fail. And the last thing I see before I lose consciousness is Kim getting shot like bad. Oof. D- well, does he die? Well, I wake up and he is not there, but you know who is? Kuno's there. <laughs> oh, your best friend. <laughs> My best friend Kuno's here, and he's like, and he's like, hey, it's you and me, man. Are and you then, in your room? Yeah, I'm in my room, and Kuno's is there. Your room clean, is your room cleaned up? Yeah, the room's been cleaned up, and <laughs> and Kuno uh, and Kuno's like, yeah, some, and he Kuno's like constantly just. Every other, I can't quote anything Kuno says because every <laughs> other thing he says has a slur in it. Sure. Uh, but yeah, he's like some, some doctor was here and he patched you up and he said, give him a call if you start acting weird or like <laughs> coughing blood or something. But otherwise, <laughs> and now Kuno is in my party. Yes. Oh, I knew it. So I knew that there was a way of getting Kuno in the party. And I didn't know how to. And do I that. did not plan this. I I did the I, I did this straight up. I did this fight straight up and role played it. Um, and I did not. But I couldn't be happier that this uh, mm-hmm. that this this has occurred. Yeah. the The other option that I've gotten is that when I played the game through the first time, I didn't get hurt, but uh, Kim did. He got mm. like shot in the arm. Mm. And so for the rest of the game that remained, he had like his arm in a sling. Oh wow! So there, there are definitely several ways to go about it. I have to imagine there's also a way where, like, Kim is seriously injured. You don't have Kuno, and you're just alone. 
I don't know. I, I'm assuming so. But yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't. I have no experience. But with that my one. injury is I was shot badly and my leg is really hurt. That's kind yeah, of. Same. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. That's the same. And, and Kim uh, took care of me for a few days and uh, now now we're good to go. Is I mean, we're not good to go. Kim basically just sorry to shortcut a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kim basically says, look, what do we have to do? And I was like, well, we've checked all the other places. Thing we didn't say in the last episode is when you're down uh, in rubies, like underneath the uh, underneath the building place, there's, there's a, there's a bunker, bunker with a vantage point, and you can rule out another angle for the shot from there. Yes, mm-hmm. the the game calls that the the boardwalk. That's not on the boardwalk. It's wild. That is in a bunker. Yeah, and so it actually should have said not boardwalk, but it should have said like in that building, mm-hmm. and that would have also given you a reason to go in that building. Yeah, other than you, then you think Ruby is there. So mm-hmm. I think I think uh, maybe that's something that will get um, altered slightly in the remake too, or in the the final cut. But so I talked to Kuno. It's like, do you know where? Because, like, it was revealed in the firefight before I shot that Gart came out and then yelled, Hey, Klausia's gone. <laughs> so I went up to Klausia's room and Klausia had uh, pinned a red string of yarn from the wall over her bed hmm. to the glass, taped it to the glass, and then from the glass to a pole outside, basically drawing a line that led directly up to the uh to like the islands north of the church which was like the third location that i had yet to see so Klausia yep. basically had figured it out Klausia had like figured out where the shot had came from and then and then fled it's really it's really funny that the game is like look if you cannot figure it out any other way so i i, I guess it's kind of interesting that you shouldn't even i mean if you're playing like quote unquote optimally right you shouldn't even bother with the visual calculus. No, stuff. you don't. You absolutely don't have to. You don't have to visit those two locations. I mm-hmm. never did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. You kind of saved it all for the end. So, so yeah. So you've got that information. And you just tell Kuno, hey, we got to go to these islands. Yeah, and Kuno's like, okay, I'll meet you there. I can't be seen with a cop like out in Martinez. <laughs> so I go to Lillian. I get the boat. Mm-hmm. I attach my uh, boombox to the front of the boat. Yeah, because Lillian is the uh, the the woman who whose fisherman husband died. She's mm-hmm. the one with the sword, and she mm-hmm. tells you earlier that she's tarring her boat, and you can use it later when she's done. And now is later. Later yep. is when you get to this plot point, not sometime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's a little sequence. It's probably one of the more cinematic sequences of the game, where you're in a boat, and just for like a minute and a half, two minutes, you. You put her up, and mine had some like mournful music in the background because of my yep. uh, radio. Sad FM. And uh, when and as the as the camera zooms out, uh, um, <laughs> Kuno is just waiting for me on the dock, and he has like this little dinghy that is that is like up at the up at the island. He's just got his arms crossed. He's just waiting for me. That's that's very good. Yeah, if you do this with Kim, Kim is rowing the boat, and you're standing at the the front of the boat with like your, George uh, Washington, <laughs> yeah, but crossing the miles. Delaware. Um, and I will say too, because I totally forgot about that, and like using the boombox, and actually I equipped my boombox <laughs> as soon as I could, and then we listened to the boombox all the way to the uh, the boat ride, mm-hmm. <laughs> like unrelated. I just thought that was important to to get some thematically cool music going. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, so, you know, it's just in my psyche ready to go. But yeah, so we get to this island and there's some um, fortifications. Yeah. It's an old, uh, you know, revolutionary uh, fortification of some sort. Uh, there's really like just three screens here. There's inside. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a fuel tank. I already had fuel that I confiscated from Cindy the Skull, who was, uh, oh God, I forgot to mention. Cindy well, the Skull did her big art statement right outside the Whirling ra- in Rags. Yeah, we haven't really talked about Cindy the Skull. We also didn't talk about the two guys who were at the um, at 
at Kim's car. Yeah. I think these are just things if you want to know about, you should play the game. They're yeah. fun little side quests, mm-hmm. but we, we didn't really schedule them in the no. thing. And uh, there's actually um, a couple more things, too, in the game that we just haven't really talked about. We might the... visit them in the reflection episode. I um... don't think we will. I think I think if <laughs> okay. you're interested in these other side quests, you should explore. You should play the game yourself. I yeah. Think. The, um, uh, but in any case, I already had a tank of gas, so I didn't have to like go anywhere else. I just filled up the tank and was able to like actuate this blast door that had been closed. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you want a tank, there is a spare tank, and it just so happens that that spare tank is in a bunker with a perfect shot up to Klaus's window. Oh, that's interesting. So I never found, I actually never found the third shooting site. Oh really? Yeah, it's just to the uh, it's just to kind of the east. Like if you go down uh, mm-hmm. t- to the mm-hmm, bottom right of that uh, room, you can exit it, and there's a little bunker and find the third shooting site. I did find so you, you know you can find a bed. And there's all these magazines, and I was mm-hmm. able to dig through those magazines, and I was able to find. Um, I, I want to get the name right here. Um, uh, gosh. Uh, oh, oh! So I was I was able to look through these magazines, and I had to check, basically, to look for like propaganda. Mm. And something's very funny here. So the game is actually this is not going to be the last time this happens. The game is acknowledging both my fascism and my communism simultaneously, simultaneously, and giving me a benefit for both. Oh, yeah. So for this check, I got a plus one for uh, a, a little descriptor that said all things commies. And the uh, other thing was plus two for enraged by communists. So I got a plus three total for my hatred and my and my love of communism. Mm. And I was able to find some critical theory underneath this uh, this bunker, uh, or not underneath the bunker, but underneath a bed. And so the in, the uh, implication being that like this person is like reading all this like popular literature, but they also are reading like partisan leftist communist literature. Mm. Mm-hmm. I just found a nude magazine. I found that too. Okay. We got both. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so we we can open this blast Blast door, door. which takes 400 years to open. (laughs) It's a real great moment of pacing, actually, I think. Mm -hmm. And and to say a little bit about pacing too, right? Like this whole thing feels like an epilogue in some ways. It does. Like it's the, it's the thing you got to do to close the case. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, it like the worst has already come to pass. I mean, for me, like I, unilaterally have failed in what I was attempting to do. Mm -hmm. And so we just got to see it through to the end. And we go outside and there is a man sitting by a fire Mm -hmm. with a uh, large rifle kind of like uh, across his knees. And his name, uh, according to the game, is the deserter. And you can kind of get his whole story in conversation. There's kind of like two parts to talking to this person. Mm-hmm. One part is his backstory, and the other part is just getting to him to confess that he killed uh, Lely, right? Mm-hmm. And you can kind of do both, and I, I kind of just worked my way through both of them. And if you've gotten this far in the game, I don't think that there's like a way to fail the second half because he's not particularly like hiding the fact that he killed the mercenary. Yeah, so the it, it is a little bit interesting the way that this works because I I got to a point in this conversation, mm-hmm. you know, we can talk in just a second about like what what the bulk of this conversation is, but I got to a point in the conversation where it was like, yeah, he did it, right? And uh, Kim says, well, hold on, do you want to do a little bit more investigation? And I think implicitly there, he's inviting me to go do what you did, which is find the shooting spot you yeah. know, to, to make that 100% ironclad. And I just kind of clicked around in the conversation a little bit more and then got back to that point and just asserted that like he, the motivation overwhelmed the material circumstances. And so you don't really even have to get him to confess. I mean, he does repeatedly say that, uh, you know, that he's been killing people. Um, and I had a I guess the closest to a confession I had were, was that. I got him to unambiguously say that he shot the the monster in the armor. Mm. And he's talking about Lily. Mm-hmm. And then between that and the gun and the location or like the implicit location just here on these islands, I was able to make an arrest. So 
I, I don't, we'll I get don't to think his, I made the best case I could have. We'll get to the backstory, but I started saying a couple things. And Kuno, who at this point in the game, it's like when Kim would normally interject, Kuno does that. But it's all mm-hmm. Kuno talk. And for the most part, when you like consult with him, a lot of times he's like, I don't know, that's cop shit, dude. <laughs> but there is one point where I try to make a case on him. And uh, I start talking about the shoes and I get off track. And Kuno's like, hey, come over here. And I consult with Kuno. (laughs) And Kuno's like, hey, you need one more thing. So that's when I go over to the bunker and I get the thing. The real censure for me is the white bells, the flowers. Because ultimately what I discover Mm -hmm. is that uh, this man... He's basically the last communist. He has survived the revolution in a moment of cowardice. He abandoned his post. He came back later, um, reaffirmed his faith for uh, historical materialism and has been living here on the island and in also various parts for my entire life, for Harry's life, 43 years. Yep. Um. And he's just been living this uh, this perpetual war and a never ending war. And he actually surrenders to me as I, as I as I come up to him. He says, "This is my, you know, this is now my official surrender, or what have you." Yeah, his unconditional surrender. And um, but he's not. That wasn't necessarily for the murder. That was just for his part in the ongoing conflict, which he claims it will never be over because class war will never be over. Well, and he. I was able to be like, well, the communists signed a treaty. And he says, no, 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 that is incorrect. The army signed a treaty. The communists did not. The communists have never surrendered. And he makes a very fine distinction. He says, I am a political officer. Yes. I am not part of the military. He is a uh, a trained communist. He is an ideological yeah. officer. So he was embedded in the military, but he was embedded for, you know, basically to uh, to perpetuate and to train the army, uh, kind of the soldiers in the ideology. So he is like, as idi- he is the ideological, like that was his role was per- mm-hmm. was like uh, propagating the ideology. Yeah. Um, and in any case, I'm able to like get a motive on him because uh, he could not stand to watch this mercenary, this like colonialism embodied. Mm -hmm. This fascist. He could not stand to see this fascist enjoying himself. And he also, Mm -hmm. uh, he basically, like, he he was, uh, he had this huge crush on Klausia from afar. He would watch her through his telescopic lens. And he hated her for uh, having sex with Lely. And Mm -hmm. he specifically wanted to aim the rifle in a way to blow his brains out onto her. And he kind of mourned and like lamented the fact that he hit him in the mouth and that that did not happen. I didn't get any of that. And after he shot him and while she was mourning him on the, her balcony, looking down at his corpse one evening, he sneaked down and he put a Maybell on, on her uh, patio in like a hopeless romantic gesture that recalled the uh, that hopeless romantic gesture from uh, the revolutionary times. Huh. Yeah. I didn't get that either. Mm-hmm. And in any case, he I, I, I also get him to admit to it, but it's a little bit more explicit because I had the location, I had the motive, I had all those other things. I got a couple other things that, that you might not have gotten. Okay. Um, one is that I kept asserting my own communism and he just kept calling me like a, you know, like a liberal idiot, basically. Mm. I, I uh, said I didn't follow politics and he called me a lump and something or other. <laughs> yeah, he also called me that. <laughs> he, uh, but yeah, I kept saying, and I was like, well, you know, we're working within the RCM to overturn it. And he was like, you cannot do that. He's like, ideological struggle is only possible, you know, outside of this. So, I mean, he's a hardliner, mm-hmm. right? And I, I think the game is positioning his hardlining as both tragic and also an impossible maneuver. You know, he, you know, even he admits the time of opportunity for yeah. communism has come and gone. Like the material conditions are no longer right. It's over. Yeah. He says it's impossible. Mm-hmm. 
to ever do it again. Uh, I also think it's interesting. Uh, this actually isn't the last time this is going to come up, but he he also um, has kind of the same blend of 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 some of the fascism and communism that I do. Uh, not not to like horseshoe theory it or anything, but he's a misogynist. He's a misogynist, uh, and he uh, laments the decadent uh, like foreign influences of of like yeah. contemporary music. Exactly. He says, "Yeah, the fascists were right about that." Yeah, and so so it's interesting that the only the the, the evidence of fascism that I as a as a uh, character, my character, that he can evidence is in misogyny and in hatred of you know, the uh, internationalist influence, whatever that is, right? Mm -hmm. And his, his communism is the exact same kind of blend that my communism and fascism as a character is too. So there, there seems to be something being said by the developers here as well. I mean, um, you know, for all of their... I, I think they are deeply suspicious of the, whatever the historical form of communism is. Mm. Um, he does he does like di like i think that there is something interesting as far as like his thoughts on race because he does like demean measurehead in my conversation with him oh i didn't i, get I, to, I didn't get anything like that i get to, i get to a a part of his tree where i was like do you hate anybody else over there or are you just watching lelly and he just has a list of people and it's claire hmm. it's joyce it's measurehead it's renee he really hates renee um which if you talk to Renee's friend on your way over, you find out Renee's dead, died, died of like a heart attack or something. Mm. Um, but I didn't. That was from a previous game. So I wasn't gotcha. able to say anything. But uh, he does say that like Measureheads, he disagrees with Measureheads racism and he says it's like bourgeois, basically. It's like a bourgeois conception of race. But I don't think that... Yeah, it's it, like I think that his perspective is like, oh, it's all bullshit. So you don't even need to worry about it. I don't know. It was kind of bizarre. I think I'm picking up on what you're picking up to. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that what there is, I think the game is doing something really. I think the writing here is deeper maybe than it is in lots of other places because there's a lot of nuance to it. Mm hmm. And I think that in a general sense, the reason that so many people, including myself, reacted so positively to this game and continue to react so posi positively to this game is that Ruby, uh, th from the wall through Ruby, feels bad. Mm. Like, it just doesn't work, I don't think. From the Mercenary Tribunal through this overwhelms whatever negative emotions you mm -hmm. have because this all works so well and it's so clearly the whole game is funneled toward making this happen so much to the extent that the ruby stuff feels even more annoying to me because it just doesn't feel like it has that same funneling to it i feel like this game would feel better like aff effectively if you got to ruby's compound and she just was not there mm. she has escaped she's gone there's no choices to make. It's and there's empty. no and there's no check to find it. You just find it. You just find it. It's empty. It's like pure emptiness. There's nothing there. And faced with the absolute failure that is not being able to get your hands around this thing, you go back to the whirling in rags and you still got to deal with this tribunal knowing that you can't resolve any of the other stuff. I think that would feel so much better. But on the flip side, God, how much worse the game would be if these things were flipped. <laughs> oh, it would be awful. <laughs> that, would, that would not be good. But anyway, well, we can save some. Sorry, I'm getting into the reflective mode. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And we can we can save some of that. But um, so we have this conversation with this dude and uh, something else happens here. Yeah. So just as a just a little callback here, uh, I asked uh, Morel, hey, what happens if I encounter a uh, phasmid? And he says, oh, well, you make sure you don't scare it. Matter of fact, I've got this um, this like pheromone that should uh, prevent it from running away. It should attract the thing. And I said, boy, give me a double dose. And I just gave him my armpit. And he just doused me with this stuff. Just want to mm -hmm. let you know that that happened. Same. I succeed on a perception check and I look over and I'll be damned if that stick bug ain't there. And it's huge. <laughs> It's gigantic, and Kuno's freaking out. <laughs> Kuno's absolutely 
<laughs> freaking out. The deserter doesn't see it at all. No. And I go up to it. And I, uh, there are a couple options. I immediately look at the red check of the options. I don't even look at the other options. Mm -hmm. And the red check is an electrochemistry check, which is a physique check. It's a pink check. Mm -hmm. And I have a 97% chance on it because I've got like, hey, my physique's so high. But also it, it specifically references getting the double dose of the pheromone. Yep. So the red Same. check is to approach the phasmid. I click it, fail, and it runs away. <laughs> Good. <laughs> That's a revenge for all those those three percent. Like that, I told you, you, the three percent out. happens for me a lot in this game. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's so. What, what did Kuno say? Was he like, "Damn, that was weird." I yell. I like holler after it runs away. No. <laughs> And and he's like, oh man, we've just made a breakthrough. And I asked Kuno, do you think people are going to believe us? And he's like, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, people are going to believe us. This is perfect. Um, it appears for me as well. I'm I reach out for it, all this stuff, and I'm like, Kim, you got to take a photo. I was like, Kim, do you see this? And he's like, yes, I see this. And I was like, you got to take a picture. And so he gets his little camera out, and I'm reaching out for it, and he takes its photograph, and it like stuns it. And so I'm able to do all kinds of stuff. I'm like touching on its leg and I'm touching its like whiskers or whatever. Whoa. I'm like touching all over, all, all over this big creature. It's foaming out of its mouth. Mm -hmm. It's like making this white yellow foam come out. And then I have an Inland Empire check and I, I click that and succeed it. And uh, lo and behold, I'm talking to this bad boy. And it starts telling me that it's, it's uh, lived here for 350 years <laughs> and there have been like four... Um, four separate political revolutions that have happened and that, that it's, it's witnessed all of this stuff happening. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my notes here. Uh, it tells me it's, a, it's killing the deserter basically that the, the deserter has lived here so long and it has lived on this Island for so long that uh, the mind it, control aspects of its like foam. camouflage it's it's that foam that's coming out of its mouth. Mm. And so that has poisoned the deserter, basically. Mm. And so he's he's dying, and that's why he can't see it at all. Oh. Um so there's that. It kind of begins giving me some philosophy. It says that that it doesn't know how long it or any natural thing will exist. And I'm I, I kind of ask, you know, what's up with that? And it says, Well, you know, humans they produce things that are unnatural. They, they produce their, or humans produce a thing that are natural, but is destructive to things, other things in the world. And they're like, well, what's that? And it's like, well, human thought, human thought proliferates and it creates its own stuff. Mm. And that stuff displaces other things. And so eventually, um, you know, in the same way that it, it says, uh, in the same way that when oxygen appeared on the planet and destroyed all the anaerobic bacteria, you know, this annihilation of life forms or most anaerobic bacteria on the earth, uh, the same thing is going to, is happening to the natural world with human thought. Humans exhale thought and it, it kills it everything. It displaces. Mm. Yeah, it kills everything it comes into contact with. And that's bad. And I'm like, you know, I'm apocalypse cop. And I was like, whoa, mm. <laughs> that's, that's fucked up. And so um, it also tells me that I can like, it it tells me to turn from her and it this, this game okay so i've i've complained about this a couple of times every time you fall asleep and like wake back up it's bringing up your ex-wife yeah. a character who i have no information about other than when i am asleep and this goddamn bug brings it up too <laughs> and i don't know who this character is i've never found out about it the way that this this game is trying to shove this this whole complex world into like a man's complicated bad relationship with his ex-wife mm -hmm. into this just like boilerplate narrative of domesticity <laughs> is a bummer <laughs> like i don't think that this is a good backbone of the narrative and if they wanted it to be more of a backbone i think it needed to be higher up in the kind of schedule of, of stuff they cared about mm -hmm. because it only is showing up in these weird moments and i'm not pursuing it because it is not interesting mm -hmm. and my character is leaning into amnesia hard mm -hmm. right like no interest in the past and so to have the show up with the bug is kind of a bummer 
Um, but then I kind of exhaust all my discussion with it and it uh, zips on out of there. Oh, it also says that it has been reproducing itself over and over and again for like a long time, probably all of human history. And because it, it uh, asexually reproduces. Mm hmm. And that's it. So it, it runs away. And then this dude, uh, the deserter, basically like becomes non-communicative. Yeah. I mean, the implication being that, that uh, I mean, he, he actually told me earlier in the conversation that he had been vomiting blood, yeah. which is bad. But uh, he, he seems to like lose the ability to think. There's something to do with this phasmid and what it was emitting that he is maybe addicted to or it had replaced some of his like cognitive function. And um, it's kind of just left to like me and Kim trying to figure out how to transport this guy. Yeah, Kuno and I kind of our our take is okay. Well, this guy's going nowhere. We'll go back and then we'll figure out the you know maybe we'll go back, drop somebody off, and then take the boat and grab him. Yep. We get in the boat. We come back. Kuno and I are met with a bunch of cops, and lo and behold, it's some of the people that were in the whirling in rags and also tramped. <laughs> Chill, chilling out <laughs> Trant Heidelstam he's our dude um, and it turns out yes the man in the sunglasses from many episodes ago uh, is our partner and, John Vicmar and uh, we co-led the major the horse- crimes uh, unit <laughs> yes we were we were with, me and John Vicmar and our like uh, disciple is mm-hmm. Judith Minot mm-hmm. who I called the horse faced woman earlier mm. And I, I I had the option to bring that up it, during this conversation. And I decided not to. Mm-hmm, I thought, mm-hmm. no, that's a bad idea. And then it turns out Trance a uh, has apparently been hired as a special <laughs> consultant. Yes. In the most bizarre twist of this game, it turns out Trant, whose background he says is in technology and like culture, has been uh, hired as a special consultant to assess my mental fitness. Well, kind of. That's what he's doing right now. Yeah. What, what he was actually part of our team before. So yes. our team, our team was Jean Vicmar, Judith Trant, who who is a civilian like consultant contractor. He is a professor. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, uh, some guy uh, who uh, just quit because of me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, he's like a, a reporter. Mm-hmm. And he, and he was our like other dude. Yeah. So we had like a crack team. We had a, the wire team mm-hmm. and it all fell apart. Mm-hmm. And um, this is the end of the game. This is the last conversation we're going to have. Yeah. Uh, I'd like Trent specifically in the, in, in our, his assessment of our, uh, like what we're up to and like what's happening with Harry Dubois. He's pulling on again, his like psycho psychological theories from Kongstein or, or whatever it is. Um, which is again a psychoanalysis. So the dude is like trying to use psychoanalysis to figure out like what we're up to. And for me, he gives a, a positive evaluation. He's like, yeah, this this dude is like he doesn't drink anymore because like, you know I've not my Harry Dubois had no alcohol this entire time. He doesn't drink. He doesn't use drugs. He is a good detective. He's been solving cases directly. Um, so you know, it, it seems like he's in a good place now. Mm-hmm. He. Gives a neutral one for me, but I agree with it. He calls me unorthodox, but I'm like doing good work. He he and Judith also kind of confer and determine that basically I did this to myself on purpose. I gave myself amnesia because I'd already had a couple episodes beforehand of heavy drinking. And basically Trant asserts that I knew that I could drink so much that I could have partial amnesia and so that I purposely did all of this to myself to completely mind wipe myself mm. in order to have all of this happen. So he, he basically asserts that like, yeah, you knew what was up and you did it to yourself. I, I did have an option to say I did this as like a tool for the investigation. Yes, I had that option too. And I didn't take any, I didn't take any kind of perspective on it and Trant filled it in. Mm. Um, and he said that it, it was logical that I did it. And I wrote this quote down. He said, you know, what else would you do if you were, quote, hardwired to the free market? <laughs> yes, he said that to me. <laughs> uh, that was a very, very William Gibson kind of line. But, um, uh, and then yeah. basically the rest of the conversation is your partner 
judging you, judging whether or not you are still um, worthy of continued membership of this squad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he starts going real hard on me and uh, talks about my alcohol and drug use, which I explicitly celebrate and say (laughs) that it's important to my Mm -hmm. identity. Um, he says I made a huge mess of any of everything, and Kuno interjects <gasps> in just an expletive and slur filled tirade, talking about how how I like showed all these mercenaries and how badass I am. Yeah, and he's just celebrating you. Yeah, he's calling complete, you a cool guy. Yeah, he's like th- this dude solved it all, and we solved a case. And he opens his mouth, and I have a chance to interrupt him, but I don't. And we just discovered a, a cryptid. We just discovered a giant bug. Um, <laughs> yeah, so a similar thing happens, obviously, with Kim. Mm-hmm. Um, Kim and, defends uh, you, but without the slurs? No, Kim uses a huge amount of slurs. It's wild. No. <laughs> yeah, he defends me. Uh, doesn't use the slurs. He says... Um, he says that I don't drink. He says my biggest problem is I'm too apologetic that, you know, which is bad for a police officer in a general sense. And I could probably work on that. He says that I'm a far right woman hating racist and that that's also bad for a police officer. He says that I'm also a communist. <laughs> and then he notes how difficult it is to square these two ideas. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so the game itself is acknowledging how weird this is. He's like, I don't know how he squares these ideas in his head, but he is very vocal about both of these things. And, uh, you know, that's something to be aware of, I guess. <laughs> and and I can say at the end of this, I can say, because Jean Vicmar is like, well, what do you have to say for yourself? And I, I just said I had the option to, like, stay quiet and some neutral thing. And then I could say, look, I am a great detective and a giant fascist. And the, and the word giant is in all capital letters. So I chose that. And Jean Vicmar ignores that. He just continues talking. So I get you at the end of the game when I'm being determined if I'm like worthy. Worthy of, in, of going back to my job. Mm-hmm. I can explicitly say. I am a giant fascist in the game pretends as if that doesn't happen or if it doesn't matter. And maybe this is commentary on whatever, but it feels like this is an opportunity to say something about this one way or the other. And, it would be, uh, it would be wild. This would be a very different thing. If Kim is like, I have personally like witnessed his like, just like off the charts racism. Yes. And you could have an opportunity to double down and be like, that's right. And the credits could roll and be like, okay, this is like, there could be consequences. It can, it can change the, the shape of the conversation. Well, I just feel like the amount of times that I have made it clear that it is impossible for me to do any kind of work without leaning into both fascism and extreme racism. You might think that Kim Kitsrog at the end would say, you know what? He solved this case, but he is uh, unqualified to be a police officer. Yeah. Currently, he just says that's bad. And obviously it is bad, but there's an opportunity here for the game to say, yeah, that disqualifies you from doing this job. And again, maybe this is some, some, uh, you know, maybe it's being critical in the sense that we know in the real world that it's not actually disqualifying. You know, we, we find lots of that behavior, uh, in all walks of life, uh, including policing, but, uh, you, you know, this is an opportunity for the game to make a, a procedural as well as literal, just in your face statement. And it dodges on that. It just kind of lets it go. Jean Vicmar says, all right, well, I guess we're going back to the station. Like, I don't, you know, this is our best. I guess, I guess it seems like you're okay. And I say, well, Kim, what are you going to do? And he says, well, I'm going to go back to, you know, he's, he's from Jamrock, right? Uh, Pre- Precinct 44. I think oh, yeah, we're from we're, Jamrock. We're all from Jamrock. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're Precinct 41. And he says, well, I'm going to go back. And I'm going to go write the biggest report possible you know, that I've ever written in my life. And I guess I'm going to talk about this, you know, phasmid we discovered because he's in on it too. Cause he's got a picture. He's got a picture. He's got a photograph and he like shows it to everybody. And everyone's like, Oh my gosh. Um, and, uh, I said, well, cause this, this is where you have the option to like, try to recruit Kim Kitsuragi to be your buddy. And in the previous time that I played, I did do that. I, I you know, recruited him. Mm-hmm. But in this instance, I didn't. I said, well, okay, well, good luck with that. I'm going to go back. I guess I'm going to do the same thing. He says, yeah, good luck with yours. And I, and then I get like a conceptualization. It's like, oh my God, 
the report I'm going to have to write on this. Mm. <laughs> it's going to be massive. And then we're done. We scoot off. There's a little bit of like epilogue kind of stuff in the dialogue box, but that's the end of the game. Wow. What um, happens with Kuno? <laughs> what do you do with him? Yeah, so I have a chance to like just say all of the stuff I did um, to like prove myself worthy because they're really down on me rejoining them for yeah, obvious that, reasons. That's a, that's a, just sorry to, to interrupt, but that's yeah. the kind of a little bit of a bummer too is it, you have the opportunity to basically say all of the side quests that you completed and the major ones that would show up here are just ones I didn't do. So I, I think I had two things that I could talk about here. And uh, that was it. But I'm sure oh, you wow. had several. No, yeah. I had several. I, I talked about um, I talked about starting the nightclub and drugged in, and they were like, "You started a drugged in." I was like, "Oh yeah, it's named Disco Elysium. <laughs> um, it's great." Uh, and he's like, "Oh my god!" And I just ran through like a whole bunch of different side quests, and um, ultimately, I talk about like how I solved this mystery. Uh, and I was able to like, I was able to provide my badge and my gun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, talk about the missing person, the, the corpse on the boardwalk. Cause I did do that. Talked about the doom commercial area. And they're like, why are you talking about this? Kuno <laughs> yeah. in the meantime is like interjecting at every moment. He's like, this pig helps people. <laughs> um, the only thing I didn't mention is confiscating drugs from Kuno's dad because I didn't want to, I didn't want to set him off. Yeah. Um, and then ultimately, ultimately they take me back. They say I'm too old and that I'm like, I'm never going to change my ways. And there's just a moment where I say, no, I, I basically confront my partner and I tell him, look, you can try to get rid of me, but my reaction says, this is a fight I can win. And I just tell Jean, I will win, Jean. I swear to God and to Revachol, I will win. Shit. And he's like, okay. And then I tell, and you know what? Kuno's joining the junior officers. He's going to join like the junior cadet force, which is like, I guess, the Boy Scouts for the police. And they're like, he's not old enough. You, you have to be 15. <laughs> and, and, and then I say, he's fucking 40. Don't you talk to me. <laughs> Don't you tell me he's too young. And Kuno gets real fired up. And they're like, okay, well, maybe we will take him in. I guess that's I guess that's what's gonna happen. Weird. And and then yeah, I, yeah, I basically <laughs> tell him, yeah, Kuno's dead. I, I, matter of fact, before I do this, I ask Kuno, what are you gonna do? And he actually is the one who said, Hell yeah, I'm gonna rock that law enforcement shit with you guys. <laughs> Detective Kuno. <laughs> uh, and that's when I tell him, yeah, he's definitely enrolling. And I, uh, I think the only way I was able to like really um, convince them is I told him, I told him, yeah, he did a great job on the island, mm -hmm. and I also had the opportunity to be like, his dad's in a coma and his only friend is gone. Um, but I don't even think I have to exercise that option. Like Trant has my back, and he's like, we can enroll him a year earlier, and he says he's fourteen. And John just surrenders and rolls over. And then I say, yeah, let's go. And it's over. God. That's a bad ending. <laughs> I mean, I mean, not bad in quality, but just like thinking about the shape of that world. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's pretty depressing. No, it, it, it is depressing in that I have played just other than not masturbating in the street. I have just exercised every instinct every like knee-jerk instinct i am just like out in the world just yeah. just a complete raw nerve um no inhibition whatsoever and i just steamroll this group of people deeply concerned about my behavior drug use and outright crime yeah you're doing crime yeah and enabling future crime yeah Whew. well what a what a time Okay, well, we're going to be back in two weeks <laughs> to, to actually talk about this game. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we'll be, you know, this is this is it. I mean, th then there is, what we're going to do is at the beginning of that episode, we'll talk about this little epilogue that we got. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's quite, there's just another pseudo-conversation. There's a, there's a scene description, maybe is the best way of putting it. 
at the very end of the game mm-hmm. that is compelling, interesting. Um, there's a setup for a sequel that's kind of related to that, but not really. You know, Kim told me, he says, well, you know, uh, you, you know, he says the um, after the the tribunal, the um, union, the harbor is boarded up and there's going to be an explosion here in the sense of something's got to give, mm-hmm. you know, uh, between the RCM, between the union between uh, Wild Pines, something's going to happen here. And uh, we don't know what's going on. So, you know, there's a little bit of a setup for for a sequel game. I don't I don't know what the plans are for that. I'm assuming that we'll hear about that sometime in the next year, if, you know, whatever the next game from, from these developers are. But we'll be back in two weeks talking about kind of our big perspectives. And I think we're going to try to read through and listen to some, you know, big essays that came out on this game and then mm-hmm. kind of talk about our feelings of where we align with other other people who have talked about this game or we don't align, things like that. But this is the end of talking about the blow-by-blow, moment-to-moment of Disco Elysium. Um, and like I said a little bit earlier, it is interesting that I was so pissed off about, <laughs> <laughs> about you know, this kind of pinch point of the game, but, uh, you know, playing the last hour and a half or so really, really saves it for me. It's a fascinating kind of self-rescue that the game does that mm-hmm. uh, I don't think other games could, but... yeah. Um, yeah, anyway. Okay. Well, uh, you can go to twitter.com slash range touch in order to find out everything that we're up to. Go to patreon.com slash range touch in order to support us. We're on the road to 1,025 pa- patrons. That's our next big goal that we're looking for. And uh, every every dollar helps, even a dollar a month. So uh, go and sign up for that and really help us out if you enjoy listening to the show. It takes us a lot of time to do it um, and a lot of time to edit it and a lot of time to put it together and do all that kind of stuff. So that would really help out. If you want to listen to this as a podcast rather than watch it on YouTube, you can go down to the description below and, uh, get access to that. I think that's going to be it. Um, you know, like the Kuno, what's the, what's the famous catchphrase? Um, bleep. (laughs) You can add a little bleep. Yeah. You know. No, I'm going to leave that bleep in. I oh. mean, I'm going to cut that out, and I'm going to use that to, to bleep every curse, curse word in the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, you love that work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, that's, that's my favorite kind of stuff. Okay, well, that's the end of the episode. Yeah. Goodbye. Okay, ciao.